This is a story about the Navy's underwater demolition team involvement in the early space program. The title of the story, Project Mercury, Faith 7. The early 1960s, an era filled with many ambitious and challenging programs, but the space race was probably the one program most on the minds of every American. President Kennedy had brought a close to the Cuban Missile Crisis, and now all eyes were on the space program and placing an American astronaut in space. We were in a two-man race with Russia, and it seemed that we were playing catch-up. America's first two attempts to put an astronaut in space happened in May and July of 1961. They were suborbital flights, and each lasted only 15 minutes. The second flight failed when, after splashdown, the escape hatch was prematurely blown, causing the capsule to fill with water and sink to the ocean's depth. Gus Grissom barely escaped with his life by slipping out and swimming free of the capsule. NASA hadn't anticipated this problem and realized that something had to be done to ensure that this would not happen again. NASA came up with a plan to develop a flotation collar and then asked the Navy to provide men from underwater demolition teams, frogmen, to attach the collar after splashdown. Frogmen would be used based on their prowess in all matters related to the ocean and their ability to work well in stressful situations. Two recovery teams, consisting of three men each, would be assigned to each of the next four flights. The first or primary recovery team would attach the flotation collar, and the second or backup team would be there in case something happened to the primary team. In February 1962, John Glenn became the first American to orbit the Earth, followed by Scott Carpenter and Wally Schirra. While Schirra was orbiting the Earth, I was in Cuba, assigned to a detachment of frogmen in support of the Cuban Missile Crisis. Having completed this assignment, we returned to Coronado and arrived just before Christmas 1962. Then, in early February 1963, our executive officer made an announcement that one man from UDT-11 and one man from UDT-12 would be added to the astronaut recovery program to replace two men being reassigned. He asked for a show of hands if anyone was interested. And of course, 70 men raised their hands. He said that if each man would put his name on a piece of paper, he would draw the lucky winner at noon. After muster, 70 men formed a line and I was at the back of the line thinking that my chance of being selected was slim at best. I stepped out of the line, went to the XO's office, and knocked on his door. When granted permission to enter and speak, I asked why he was choosing a replacement by drawing a name from a hat when I was obviously the man for the job. I also told him that he would be making a huge mistake by selecting a man other than me. He listened intently and then smiled and said, I like what you did here. The job is yours. He then confronted the men still standing in line and told them he had made his selection and Nicholson was his man. At this point, I was temporarily relieved of routine UDT duties and started training in earnest for the May 16, 1963 recovery of astronaut Gordon Cooper's Spate 7 capsule. We worked with a replica Mercury capsule and flotation collars provided by NASA. The crews from Helicopter Anti-Submarine Squadron 6, the Navy's best, were teamed with us and we worked tirelessly for the next several months, both day and night, jumping into the ocean and attaching the flotation collar. NASA and the Navy Department provided us with training manuals that covered every aspect of the mission. We had to know what to do if the astronaut was unconscious or injured. We would use various colored flares to communicate with the recovery ship, USS Kearsarge. Each flare had its own specific meaning. The training was thorough, exacting, and fun. Cooper would be the first astronaut to spend a prolonged period of time in space, orbiting the Earth 22 times in roughly 33 hours. NASA had no idea how man would react to weightlessness over a prolonged period of time. A lot was expected of Cooper, and he would prove that he was up to the challenge. 
On May 16, 1963, we boarded our helicopter at approximately 1,200 hours or noon and lifted off the deck of the Kearsarge. Then, over our headsets, we were informed that Cooper had lost communication with the Cape. This meant that Cooper would have to bring Phase 7 in manually, something that had never been done before. On all previous flights, NASA would basically fly the spacecraft. When it was time for re-entry, NASA would tell the astronaut when to fire the retro rockets and the capsule would come back to Earth. Chuck Yeager, the first man to break the sound barrier, referred to the Mercury 7 astronauts as spam in a can. Because they did not fly the spacecraft, they just went along for the ride. This was certainly not the case with Cooper. He was out there on his own and about to be tested to his limits. On his 21st orbit, the Phase 7 capsule lost all electrical power. That meant Cooper would have to rely on his wristwatch to time the firing of the craft's retro rockets for re-entry. He would also have to manually adjust attitude, pitch, and yaw of the spacecraft by firing six small thrusters located on the spacecraft. Using a grease pencil, Cooper marked the curvature of the Earth on this capsule's window. This and his view of the stars would be his only guide for re-entry. If the descent of the capsule were too steep, the G-force would kill Cooper. Too shallow, and the capsule would skip off into space. During all that was happening, NASA could only stand by and listen. They could hear Cooper, but could not communicate with him. Cooper had now been in space for nearly 33 hours and was completing his 22nd and final orbit of the Earth. So exact was the firing of the retro rockets that missing the mark by one second could put the spacecraft as far as 100 miles from the primary recovery area, two seconds, 200 miles, and so on until 10 seconds, and at that point, the spacecraft would skip off into space, never to be seen again. We waited impatiently, and just when all seemed lost, we witnessed the impossible. Floating down under a bright red and white parachute was the Phase 7 capsule and Gordon Cooper. He had actually pulled it off and brought the Phase 7 capsule to within four miles of the recovery ship, and he had done this manually. Once the capsule splashed down and the parachute had separated from the craft, we were insuited by the helicopter and started to perform the task we had trained for. Bert Swift swam to the capsule to make contact with and assess the condition of Cooper, while Ari Salant and I swam the flotation collar to the capsule. Everything was moving along smoothly, and in a very short period of time, the flotation collar was attached. The recovery had gone perfectly. We were now able to communicate with Cooper, who was one very happy astronaut. We asked Cooper if he wanted to egress from the capsule now or wait until the craft was towed back to the Kearsarge. A boat had been dispatched from the Kearsarge with a long tow line, and when told this, Cooper opted to stay with the capsule until hoisted aboard the ship. When back on board the Kearsarge, the hatch was blown and Cooper was given the hero's welcome he so rightly deserved. The space pro program had been given a huge boost because of the remarkable flight and Cooper's unbelievable accomplishments. Our job was now complete. We had done what we had so rigorously trained to do and the Navy and Cooper were pleased with our performance. During our debriefing, one of the reporters asked if we were aware that a number of sharks had been seen swimming near the capsule. None of us had seen the sharks, probably because we had been so focused on the job at hand. We were then asked what we would have done had we known. To that, Ari simply replied, it would have been very crowded in that tiny old capsule, the three of us and Cooper. If you enjoyed this story and would like to read my book, you can go to www.udt-seal-stories.com and I will send you a signed copy. If you prefer Kindle, go to Amazon.com, Books, and type in Nick Nicholson. Thank you.